To paraphrase Hunter S. Thompson, when you get locked into a serious beer collection, the tendency is to push it as far as you can. Cheers. Son of a bitch! Give me a drink! All right, welcome back to the Tap Takeover podcast and our brewery interview series. We're sitting down at Raised Grain Brewing with Nick Reichstadt, Sales and Marketing, and Dr. Scott Kelly, Head Brewer, both owners here at Raised Grain. Really excited to talk to you guys about the big win at the Great American Beer Fest, big new release this coming Saturday of the... Le Trois Docteur. Le Trois Docteur. It's, it's a Belgian quad brewed with Pinot Noir grapes. Uh, so Dr. Scott Kelly, who's, who's here with me, is a practicing physician. Our other brewer, Jimmy Gosset, is also a practicing physician so two doctors and then uh, one of their longtime friends Christian is a third doctor who owns a vineyard out in the Willamette Valley in Oregon and we got a bunch of Pinot Noir grapes from his award-winning winery and we brewed the quad with those so three docs one Belgian quad it's unbelievable but we'll talk about it more later because we're going to crack, crack a bottle open. We've got a, we've got awesome. a whole lot for you guys this week. So we've gotten a lot of great feedback on our previous episodes and we'll continue to roll out some of our new improvements every week. Best way to keep in touch and see what we're up to is by following us on Facebook and you can send us more questions and feedback at taptakeoverpodcast at gmail.com. As we've said, this week we're here at Ray's Green. Can't wait to get their thoughts on the Milwaukee Southeastern Wisconsin brewery scene. Do they have cellars full of whales? What do they have aging? But before we get into those topics, let's talk about the facility and how they got started. So you're one of the uh, newest breweries uh, that we've interviewed. So I also want to know more about how did you get into distribution of your beer? Well, that's, a, that's a couple of questions. It so um, we'll start off with how we chose this location. So uh, Scott... Jimmy and our third partner, Kevin, live in Brookfield right now. I grew up in Brookfield. Waukesha is right next door to Brookfield. We wanted to be close to home. As we were looking at uh, all the, the potential spaces, Waukesha just seemed like a really great fit. It's a, it's a great city, it's a great community, and we wanted to be part of that. It's also very close to Brookfield, where we call home. It's, it's very important to us to bring people together. So Waukesha made all the sense. It also solves a couple of other um, necessary challenges that we need to do overcome. We need to be by where these guys work because they have a day job. They're both practicing physicians. And I mean, that's that's a challenge yeah. that we have to deal with on a daily basis. How can we brew more beer when these guys have 60 hour, 70 hour a week day job? And, and they're very important jobs. So we need we needed the brewery to be close to where they work. So it solves a number of those. And we're the only one out here doing anything like this in Waukesha. So we've had great reception from the community, from the city, and it's been uh, it's been a fantastic 18 months so far. Awesome. So for those who may not have been out here yet, uh, you're tucked away a little yeah. bit. How did you come to find this particular location? Well, I like to say that we are tucked away, but it's, as I say to everybody, it's, it's very, very easy to get to. It's just hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> so well, once you get out here, you, you know, it's, it's very easy. We ended up here probably uh, largely from, it's said it's from working with, I was working with a uh, couple of realtors and it was just dumb luck. I was looking down around the 124th corridor just off of uh, Wauwatosa, between Wauwatosa and Brookfield, which is very close to my office. Because I needed some place I could get to and from, building the brewery to brew, um, the beginning brews, I was running all of the beginning brews and working full-time, no brewery assistance. So I needed, I needed proximity. So looking down in that area, didn't, we weren't finding a lot. And all of a sudden, a realtor says, I, I've got a spot for you. It wasn't us saying, oh, there's Brew and Grow, and let's go right next to Brew and Grow, because we had a built-in you know, built uh, clientele right there. It wasn't how it worked. It just so happens that they said, well, we've got this space right here. You know, Happy we, coincidence, right? Coincidence. Serendipity. As, as a ton of this stuff is serendipity, when you look back at how everything got going, uh, you couldn't have written it how it ended up, how all of us met. I never knew it before this. You know, four parties ending up together in a very uh, circuitous sort of way. Hey, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, right, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you that are listening, there are four gentlemen sitting here interviewing us. So it's a, a very, 
very harmonious day. Yeah, I mm -hmm. suppose we should go around the table and introduce ourselves so everybody gets a, a sense of who's talking when. I'm Alex. This is Jesus. This is Andy. And uh, I'm Jim, and this is uh, one of the few times we've actually all been together for an interview, so this is great. And I'm Nick. I'm Scott. So were you guys uh, home brewers at home? Did you guys put together some uh, some crazy concoctions back at the domicile? Yeah, I was. I, mo most of our original, all of, I shouldn't say most, all of our original recipes that we opened up with came out of my basement. And that brings how Jimmy came into the game as well. Uh, oddly enough, when I was a medical student at the VA back in the, oh, would that be in the early, early 1990s? 90s. <laughs> early 90s. Where, I right, was, right when you passed Leeches 101. <laughs> <laughs> Ask them? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, that means something different to me than you. Uh, anyway, oh, anyway, so. Look up what he does for a living, you'll know. I'm a pathologist, yes. Yeah, so, I, I happened at that time, I was doing internal medicine, and Jimmy happened to be my uh, chief resident at the time. And chief residents don't hang out with medical students, and we ran to each other on his 40th birthday, probably 10 years, 15 years after that, and hit it off immediately. Him being a big beer lover, I'm a big beer lover, always have been a big beer lover, it's been my history. He's from Belgium, first, his dad was first generation over. One thing led to another, became best of friends, and he invited me one day to do a brew on his so stove. Tough. We got done brewing, I said, Jimmy, this has been a hell of a fun. <laughs> we drank beers together, we hung out, we talked a bunch. You know, we muddled around with filters, trying to get the beer to filter through it and all these sort of things that seemed to me relatively archaic. And I said, Jimmy, this is great. I said, but let's, I'm gonna build a brewery and then, and then let's do our own recipes from here on out. So about the next year and a half, I read everything I could read on what it meant to build a brewery and built a brewery in my basement. <laughs> and my wife can tell you, she was she was supportive, but very say, what, what, what are you doing? Because I had conical fermenters, stainless steel that could be heated, could be cooled, built an all electric brewery so I could brew inside my house. And I said, Jimmy, we're ready to go. We did our first recipe, it was interesting, you're wearing a, a Three Floyds shirt there. Our first recipe we ever did was a clone of of Dreadnought, which oh, is, nice. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite beers of all time, yeah, and, and Three Floyds like was, is kind of one of my favorite breweries. And from there, we created our own recipes with some sort of mind's eye back there that someday we might have the opportunity to do something like this. I mean, as a couple of physicians, we had no idea how that would happen, <laughs> but we started creating and started modeling everything we were doing. So you my home brewing it. experience is equally as illustrious. I home brewed <laughs> three times on my stovetop with uh, two of my friends. I was a professional cyclist in a past life, which was a lot of fun. I met a ton of friends, and two of the guys that I raced with early on have been lifelong friends, so we started up the Three Freds Brewing Company. <laughs> nice. um, so it was me, Jason, and Scott. Hey, guys. And we, we did three brews on, on the stovetop. Had a ton of fun, drank a lot of beer, didn't log anything. Um, <laughs> they all turned out... Um, you, you didn't have the clinical precision? Of, no uh, clinical precision whatsoever. Positions. We forgot to mill the grain one time, so we actually <laughs> crushed it with the Roller, a rolling thing. Uh, so the good news is I do not brew the beer here, nor, <laughs> nor do I practice medicine, and the world is a better place because of that. Yeah, uh, pro tip from Nick, uh, it's only screwing around unless you write it down. <laughs> so as I was doing that, I, I, uh, I enjoyed it. I had already been looking into some of the, the things on the business side, how you can make money doing it and how how you can do it. And I've, I've always been a very personable person. I like I like sitting down with people. I love food. I love beers because it brings people together. I would love to mesh that with my professional life so that I, I just get to live a fun lifestyle and enjoy what I do. So that's, that's what drew me to it. So I started working on the business model and all that stuff. I was working with my dad for a while. He's been a lifelong entrepreneur and he was a, a great sounding board for what do you do when you start up a company? How do you grow it? How do you get investors? How do you do this? How you do that and he was he was kind of guiding me through the process he was out on a bike ride once and my dad sorry dad you're you're a little bit of a bigger guy and he lives on the top of the hill so he was down at the bottom biking up back home and his neighbor kevin was out in his driveway cleaning his car or something like that washing the car so it's a lot easier to stop and talk to kevin than bike up the top of the hill and, and get home so he stops and talks to kevin and says well this is what my son nick is working on and kevin said well that sounds like a pretty cool idea have him come talk to me went and talked to kevin the first business plan i actually got laughed off of the back of uh, kevin's path 
patio. He said, maybe come back to me when you have a little bit of experience. <laughs> um, so I doubled down, worked on it, had a, a very different business model than what, what you see here at Raised Grain right now. But that intrigued Kevin and I made a lot of changes and he said, I think we're to the point now where I have two people that I would like to introduce you to. And that was Scott and Jim. So uh, Kevin knows Scott, again, through a very serendipitous process. Kevin's wife, Deb, plays tennis with Scott's wife, Lisa. Kevin ended up at a party at Scott's house and they were down in, in Scott's basement brewery drinking Scott's beer. And Scott may have mentioned at some point, like, I'd love to open up a brewery. That would be really cool. <laughs> so that was always in Kevin's, the back of his mind. So when I'm sitting on his, his patio, he was able to make the connections. And for whatever reason, he thought the business model made a lot of sense. And I, I think he believes in, in both me and Scott and Jimmy. The first night we came together was September 19th, 2014. We stayed up till four in the morning. I would like to point out that I'm the youngest member of the group, but I'm also the one that at four o'clock said, guys, I think we're staying up a little too late. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go to bed. Uh, the voice so got laughed out of the room again. I think Kevin left like four hours earlier. <laughs> True. We so were getting together while we were doing a brew in my basement. Nice. <laughs> but that was also the day where we said, let's do this. We've got a great team. We all get along really well together. We can have a lot of fun doing this. We can make a business out of this. And we can, we can grow this. And that was the day that we all put our hands in the middle and said, hurrah. It was just under a year later that we opened our doors. So that, that brings us right, right to the question. The name Raised Grain. I mean, I read a great story on the internet on how you guys came up with that. Why don't you share that story with our listeners real quick? It's, that's definitely next to share. It, it came about because as I was working through with my dad, it all started off because he owned a cabinet making company on 35th and State Street, just up the block from Miller Brewing Company. Sure. I worked there growing up as a kid. For a while, it was the shop on the streets of Old Milwaukee exhibit at the Milwaukee Public Museum, but with the, the revamp, it's no longer there. But so about four, four and a half, five years ago now, I don't, I don't even know, it's just been a blur of the past two years. He sold the company by name, but he got to keep the building. So we've got this really cool old cream city brick building with multiple levels. And I'm like, well, it'd be pretty cool to put a brewery in there. So I started working on that and that's, that's kind of the whole time where Three Freds was in existence and I was brewing beer on the stove top. So I'm working on that and then he goes and sells the building. So I'm kind of out of a Thanks business model, yeah. Which is a blessing in disguise because it was a really old building and there was a, a really old boiler in there that's probably gonna meet its demise at some point. It worked out well because we ended up here. Raised grain comes from the, the woodworking background that I have where I grew up taking something that's raw and turning it into something that's beautiful and, and, and everybody can appreciate. And then it's something that brings people together that's what I did growing up. So raised grain has a number of meanings. It connects to beer because you're, you're elevating grain to its most distinguished form, which is what we're drinking right now. It has the woodworking connection where we're taking something raw and turning it into something that everybody can enjoy. And then I think it speaks to the personalities of the, the four owners where we're bold, we're passionate, we're not afraid to share what we think, whether that is what is conventional knowledge or not, we're happy to share that. So we're a little bit brash, we're rough, we're raised, all of that. So it's got all of those meanings tied into one and it, it's a, a unique name and I think it's served us well so far and will continue to serve us well. I have a couple questions on the business side of things and then we're going to get into the beer. <laughs> Um, some of your business plan that you got came up, you know, is on the internet as well and articles about you guys. And according to that plan, you guys have a strong focus on rapidly expanding distribution, penetration, and your territory. You've recently gone to several craft beer stores with Bombers. What are your plans for expanding your territory and market penetration? Organic. We're going to do it from within. Okay. So we're going to expand. That comes with limitations and time. You know, we're I, all, I, I, you know, we're there's all about breaking news. There are a lot, there are a lot, there are a lot of ways to expand your, your gotcha production. journalism right? again. <laughs> you can contract if you want to contract to yep. expand your production. My my wherewithal would be to not necessarily go that route. So that actually is my follow-up for you would be with the ex expansion and increased production how long before you outgrow your current location oh, or yeah. there was plans in the past that i read where you're planning on contract growing in wanaki right that's how the oh, actual I, business I, plan began that, that, was, was, that where was the began. evolution where that was it, evolution yeah. we came okay. back to this which is one of the reasons why we built the system we built which is a seven barrel ten barrel mash done because of the size of boldly brewed beers we do that's why this size was was chosen it's a little bit of a experiment in testing of concept to Kevin and to ourselves and does our beer sell? Are people going to like it? But anybody can tell you that knows anything about beer brewing that seven barrel system is not a 
system that's meant to distribute from. We don't have there's, any efficiencies there's here. There's no efficiencies. The only, the only efficiency is for brewing beer for our tap rooms. Okay. And if, the greatest thing we have is diversity. I think for a young brewery, we have a large repertoire of beers, and we can thank this size system for allowing that to happen. People that have 20 and 30 barrel systems out of the blocks, it's a lot of beer to move and it's, it's tough it's to be diverse. It's a lot harder for them. You know, we have every Belgians to Kelsch's to you name it, we, we have a lot of stuff. So we're not just stuck on some IPAs and a few IPAs, but we, we've been able to do, I don't know, 18 different styles of beer in the first year and a half or something like that. Well, it's, yeah. I was just looking at Untapped and we've got we've got more than 20. <laughs> so that, that, see, that, that, that's amazing. For a consumer to be able to come up to your tap room and see a different beer on the, on the list every time, is one thing, but to see several different beers on the list every single time they come, even if they're regulars, that's hard to do. And and hard to do with the, the amount of production that you guys are putting out. Right. So uh, kudos to you guys. Thank you. And, and actually, say, it's, growing organically like that too is, I mean, every single beer I've tried from you guys, I've absolutely loved. Well, thank you. I mean, you know, we, we brought the ones that we brought because... We loved them. We, we control a lot of processes here, too, that allowed us to transfer from a basement level to here. I've always used all our own water. I've always built all my own water profiles uh, for whatever beer we're brewing. That's universal. You can do it any place in the country, and you're not going to be affected. So you go to Waukesha Water, we're not being affected. Um, I'd like to be in control of and have us be in control of the process we're doing. So as far as we, we basically have hit our head on the seat. This place is probably going to be maxed out in production this year. No ability to to do any greater volume than we're doing right now. We're actively looking to do something. Uh, haven't figured out exactly what that is. We have you, no have, idea what that is right now. We're okay. working on okay. it. We're, we're, we will get that from you, don't worry. Um, I'm sure you, yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll beer board us, right? No, <laughs> yeah. that, that sounds, sounds like a fun way to get tortured. Yeah. 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 It's where that we fit into a board and drink all your beer. <laughs> <laughs> That would be torture. Yeah. No, I guess the mock-up of the, you know, the new Box Arena has got a brewery in front of it, right? Is that? So the mock-up of the new Box Arena has got a brewery in front of it, right? Yeah, yeah, I think we know, yeah, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> Had a try. <laughs> Pretty sure I know exactly who that is. Do you? No. <laughs> you know, you're not allowed to know that? Okay. No, I think I made that up right there. Okay. No, I, oh. Gotcha journalism at its finest. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get so that. one of the really fun parts about where we're uh, recording today is that we're actually recording among the uh, among the tanks. Uh, so you're actually going to hear a little bit of a brewery in process, which is kind of fun. We get to hear a little bubbling, a little uh, little background noise. Whatever is, that was. <laughs> <laughs> this is a real brewery in progress, and that's part of the fun of doing this podcast. We get to come to these breweries, meet the brewers in the, their natural environment. And it's like being on uh, natural, uh, National Geographic, but, you know, with, with beer involved. Yeah. All we need is David Attenborough, and we'll have a PPC program. We should mention, of course, that this is a live tasting going on, and the uh, first beer we have in front of us is the Paradox Red. Now, now, this is the Great American Beer Festival gold medal winning in the Imperial Red category. What was that like? Not just winning the award, but what was it like the entire process from conception to brewing to award? Well, you talk about the conception, I'll talk about winning the award. The conception was, you know, a lot of, a lot of beers that we made, you have a mind's eye what you're trying to create, which I would say is, is often spurred on by a beer. It's often a beer you drink, you're like, I like this style. And the Imperial Red IPA style is not a style that's been very heavily delved into. But honestly, you know, way back when, Jimmy and I were fans of Goodnight from Oscar Blues. Kind of the mind's eye went to saying, you know, what is that? What's creating that? What's that sort of caramely characteristics that we're getting from that in, in a red? But not, not a danky red. And, and I, I think that was what, when our mind went into creating things, which is, you know, putting ingredients in that hopefully match what your mind says they're going to taste like. And that's, that's kind of the goal as I create recipes. That's what I'm thinking about. That's what we were trying to do, something caramely, but yet that had a very hobby character, very hobby characteristics with it. It was designed as, I don't know if for a fact, it was either the fourth or fifth beer we ever made. Oh, wow. Wow. And there was some fine tweakings that went on beyond that, but not a lot. It was out of the box. It was, boom, here it is. Wow, what, what do we have here? And I think the whole time we were brewing, it was Jimmy and my, it was both of our favorite beers. It still probably is my favorite. Mm -hmm. I, 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 think, I think if you pulled anyone in the tap room, any of the beer tenders that we have, that's going to be their number one favorite beer. That's great. And we don't, we don't force that upon them. We don't make them <laughs> like that beer. We I haven't fired anyone for not saying. You don't, you don't <laughs> beer board them with Paradox Red until they, uh, until they like it. Yeah. <laughs> so switching a little bit more on production, do you have a 
house strain of yeast, or do you uh, change yeast? We do. That's, that's, a, very good that's a great question. And, and one of the challenges that we ran into when it came to creating as many diverse beers as we had, and at the beginning having very limited production schedules, I was not willing to sit on yeast in a cooler that might be dying. So converted over to all dry yeast. We use nothing but dry yeast in this okay. place. New yeast every brew. New yeast every single brew. Oh, wow. We, we compost the old yeast with a farmer who also takes all of our grain. So it works out great for him. He loves that. Yeah. He loves to get the yeast, by the way. It's just fantastic for him. And so we're doing new pitches. All that. It's not the most economic way to do things, but I'll tell you what, the reproducibility is amazing. I actually put an RO system in my house within the first four brews we ever did as well because if you brew with Brookfield water, there's eight different wells it draws from. So. It's impossible to do the chemistry when you don't know which well which you're well getting your water from. And so uh, stripping the water bare and building the mineral profiles for the type of beers we're doing made a lot of sense to me from the get-go. Yeah. So how do you monitor your water chemistry then? It's there's Start from zero. It. Start from zero. Okay. <laughs> Six parts per million of anything in the in the water which is negligible. And we build every water profile for every year. So it's all, it's, to me it's all about the chemistry of it. So a lot of this is art, a lot of it is science. And when you're hitting your mash ton pH is the way you want to hit them, you're golden. If you know what if you know what you're using from a malt standpoint, dark malts, light malts, you know what type of water profile you have to have. It's the reason why some parts of the world make dark beers better than others. That's why out west they make light beers really well, high calcium levels. It tends to drive your, your pH a little bit lower than it would be without it. So we're trying to hit a pH level is what it comes down to. There's the science of it, and, and the, I think the, the art side of it is think that mind's eye that I was talking about. What grains create these flavors that I want to have when it comes time to drink the beer? And that's how I think about every beer we design. And a lot of it's off the cuff. So in your, in your wildest dreams, coming back to the Paradox Red, did you, did you ever have expected to win GABF no, no. gold that, that fast? No. No, no. no, no. <laughs> so we, what, what has that done for your brewery then as far as you well, know, we, we national and, and local interest? I don't know about national, but local interest. I mean, we can't keep up with production on Paradox. We, we'd love to make more. We'd love to put more bottles out there, more kegs out there. But right now, at this moment, we've waitlisted accounts that have been great accounts, and we've sold to them, but we just don't have enough in our cooler to sell to. So one of, one of your questions earlier was, what was it like winning the award? I was sitting in the office, uh, which is just a, it's our global headquarters. It's a very small <laughs> office, very, very cramped. Uh, but I'm sitting in there and I got a text from Henry from Mobcraft. He was out at the GABF and he said, you know, it was something like, congratulations on winning the gold. And I'm like, uh -huh. gold in what? <laughs> I didn't know they were, I, I didn't even know GABF was going on at the time because oh, wow. we're just so busy doing the stuff we need to do. Scott, Kevin, and, and I think Jimmy was, he was working that day, but uh, Scott and Kevin were out. We, we built our own food truck out in Waukesha. It's been difficult to get food trucks to come from Milwaukee. You got to have food at a tap room so you can have a, just a great experience, great, great beer, great food. So we built our own. So those guys are out there pumping stoves onto the truck and getting it all set up. I mean, and that just, that just, just on a tangent, we are all very hands-on owners. So it's not like we've got this guy sitting off on a beach and, Cabo somewhere, <laughs> sipping Mai Tais or something, just giving us a bunch of money. We're all very hands-on. Oh, you guys, you guys are too small to be, yeah, yeah to no, be every, that way. Yeah. Everybody, everybody is hands-on. We've got great employees that just go above and beyond in everything they do. Everybody sees what's going on here, so everybody's hands-on. So, I get a text because I'm paying taxes or something like that, or paying bills, writing checks, and those guys are out on the food truck, like lifting 600 pound ovens onto the, the truck, and I run out there, I'm like, oh my God! And there was just a bunch of screaming for about two minutes, and then we just had to go back to work, because, <laughs> you know, so we celebrated, and then I went off to an Oktoberfest uh, festival just down the road, and that was it, and then- Moved on like, with well, your day, we, right? How do we, yeah, how do we brew it more, because- Oh yeah, because you're gonna blow up at that point. Yeah. People now know about you on a national scale. It is the biggest beer festival in the entire world. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a hell of a challenge. It's surreal. And then to be the only to be the yeah. only one in Wisconsin that won a gold this year too. That's the that's the challenging part. Of it. Where do you go from here? <laughs> <laughs> right? I'd say only up. Right? Yeah, well, you has to go. <laughs> So let, let's talk about the beer that we're drinking for our listeners. What uh, what what are we getting out of this? You talked about some some red dankness. What uh, I'm saying is uh, I'm saying a red without the dank. Oh, without so the a dank. A lot of reds have a little bit of an aftertaste dank to them, if, if you will. That are it's very malt based. This has a very caramel 
sort of crystal malt driven back to it that's, that you can sit the hops against. And then it's just dominated by Amarillo and Citro. I mean, it's a very heavy, heavy uh, Amarillo Citro based beer, a little bit of Hallertow in it. I have no idea why that's there, but it seemed like the right thing to do at the, at the time. Going back to September 19th, 2014, we're down in Scott's basement. He's got the keyser down there with eight taps, and we taste this beer, and it's it's got this bright, hoppy, citrusy nose and, and flavor to it, but then it just blends seamlessly with this, this caramel backdrop. And it's Kevin, who his idea of craft beer at that point in time was Blue Moon in a cooler. <laughs> <laughs> and then you... No, no you, offense, Blue Moon. <laughs> yeah, no offense, Blue Moon. But then he would, you know, go on to different beers later in the night that are maybe a little bit lighter. So he's like, Nick, what do you think? I'm like, this this beer is amazing. That was the beer that got us excited and, and it's, it's carried on through. So it's, not only is it one of our favorite beers from a flavor profile, but just from a story standpoint, it's really, really cool. And it has a lot of meaning to us. Yeah, it, it really is an amazing balance between those malts and those hops. I, I'm a huge IPA lover. I think a lot of us are. And we love the double IPAs, and we love that balance between the malts and the hops. But taking that to a red level is, I, I, on some level, it's a little genius. You know, there's and the, the, the hops that you guys decided to use, there's such a beautiful interplay between the two. So kudos to, you know, hats off to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So with this being the Tap Takeover podcast and you guys wanting to tell your story, which which of your beers would you guys choose to kind of tell your story if you were going to take over the taps at the Tap Takeover podcast? What beer would you say represents you? I would tell our story through the diversity. I would tell our story through through everything from a lighter classic IPA like our AHA to Paradox Red to the Belgo, the uh, Black Walnut Belgo Stout that we made at, the, at that end, all the way to a Hefeweizen at the other end that's done in a classic Hefeweizen. Ability with, not classic Hefeweizen, but we do rest at 113 degrees, 126 degrees, 152 degrees to get the quality characteristics of Hefeweizen to come out. So it's that diversity, I think, is, is, is what I would say represents us most. And you know, on, on top of that, we have a lot of Belgian twists to everything. And, and Jimmy, Jimmy's dad was a first generation Belgian physician here. And he and I immediately got up, got into Belgian beers from the get-go. So our bird's eye triple is a Belgian triple that's hopped. You know, it's a little a shoe fish, if you will. So that diversity from Belgian to and even a little bit of German now that was really kind of driven by, by Kevin and saying, what do you have for the people that want a lighter beer? And we developed the Kolsch and the, and the Hefeweizen for those people that come in that want something that's not just an IPA. You know, you realize that there's a lot of people out there tasting beer and you, you can't tell them what to like. You like what you like. And my dad used to say, he worked for Heilman's, was you like what you drink. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and which comes first isn't always, the, that's, it's not always so straightforward. So anyway, I would say that diversity is what describes this probably best, if that makes sense. So you guys recently had big news the other day uh, with, the, with the whole brewers thing. So can you tell us, uh, our listeners, what, what beers you're going to have at Miller Park this year? Yeah, so uh, our, our Kelsch. Kilted Kelsch is going to be uh, one of the two offerings. Really light, crisp, German-style ale. It's got a, a very nice Pilsner malt flavor to it. Just a little bit of a lemony flavor from the uh, the yeast we use. Easy drinking, perfect for a super hot day. And then we have Dox Red IPA, which is a more sessionable version of the Paradox Red. When you're sitting for nine innings, you hope it's only nine innings. Sometimes they go a little <laughs> longer. If they do, you're glad you're drinking Dox Red instead of Paradox because it's 6.9% versus almost 9%. It's just a little bit easier, more easy drinking, but it, you still have that really intense citrus aroma and a very nice caramely backdrop, but a lot easier to drink. We bumped into them at a, at a tap takeover. They said, this beer is really amazing. Come on in. We'd like to try some of your beer because we're thinking about putting some beer on at Miller Park. And that meeting over a beer, I think that's where all the, the best meetings happen. <laughs> I agree. We ended up at the big Miller Park announcement yesterday, and we're going to be on tap for the 27th season with not one but two beers which is really fantastic it's it's a great opportunity for us to get in front of thousands upon thousands of people every day that they have a, a home game very cool and I, I should also point out Scott has a little bit of a history in baseball oh yeah yeah oh, I actually yeah. played at the old county state <laughs> California you know, Penal League played for, for, play for the Badgers when I went to the school there for my freshman year so nice. yeah, baseball's a varsity baseball ball. player yeah <laughs> So what what position? Batting average? Uh, what are we talking? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were, we were, I think we were the one of the few undefeated teams ever won state in the state of Wisconsin. We're twenty three and zero, and state champions uh, back in nineteen eighty six. I was pitcher and catcher. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so you caught your own balls. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he tell you how fast I was. You know what? After, <laughs> after that, I throw very slow. When after you were done talking, I'm like, this is where Jim jumps in. And says, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wanted to pump in a little something about the Doc's Red IPA. You know, everybody said you'd make it, make a lighter version of Paradox, right? Which is, by the way, Paradox. Everybody gets that. Not. Not paradoxical, but pair of docs. So Sometimes anyway, it takes a people a little, it, it does take a little while. I think that's a good point to stop and actually try that beer and find out what you guys do for an actual job. I know you're yeah. here whole time, but Scott, you do something a little different, so we want to talk about that. But we're thirsty, and we should probably get another beer. Yeah, so awesome. we'll be back in just a bit. We're going to do the 100 batch. Hey, number 100. The batch number 100. We're going to do a sneak peek of this Saturday. We might just pop one of those bottles open. and uh, Les Trois Dates. We'll be back after this. Now for this episode's edition of Beer News. That's right. Only two March-April beer releases worth talking about right now. Releasing from Firestone Walker on March 25th, 2017 version of Parabola. This Russian Imperial Oatmeal Stout is aged for a full year in a blend of bourbon barrels from Elijah Craig, Four Roses, Pappy Van Winkle, Woodford Reserve, and Buffalo Trace. Developing flavors of rich, chewy, roasted malts, charred oak, and bourbony vanilla. No news on when it will hit our market, so make sure to ask your local craft beer store guy, because this will go quick and they will only be allocated one case of bombers on april through 3rd founders kbs hits our distro area founders kentucky breakfast stout is brewed with a hint of coffee and vanilla and then aged in oak bourbon barrels for over a year it is sure to go fast so make sure you get to your craft beer stores that week in brewery news good city brewing has been crowned champion of the brewing news national double ipa competition with its reward double ipa this beer which surpassed over 90 other beers from some of the most respected breweries in the nation including past winners melvin and tamarack brewing Good City is located on the east side of Milwaukee on Farwell Avenue. You can also find their brews at most of your decent craft stores in the greater Milwaukee area. This is a huge game changer for a new brewery, which will spur ambitious expansion and growth. Microphone debuted their new brewery location and tap room in Elk Grove, Illinois this past Saturday. They are the hottest up-and-coming brewery in the Chicago area, if not the Midwest. Their Smells Like Beaten Spirit and Imperial Stout is highly sought after and a phenomenal beer. It is also highly tradable. I was at the grand opening this weekend and the cult-like following is reminiscent of three Floyds in their early days. With a tap room limit of only 45 people and at least 200 in line, some folks waited two to three hours just to get inside the tap room. If you're in the O'Hare Airport area, this place is a must stop. Now on to beer festivals. On Saturday, April 8th, we have the Gitchy Gumi Beer Festival in Superior, Wisconsin. On Saturday, April 22nd, you can take your pick of beer festivals depending on where you live in the state of Wisconsin. Dairy State Cheese and Beer Fest in Kenosha, between the Bluffs Beer and Wine Cheese Fest in La Crosse, Craft Brews, and Chicago Blues in Delavan. But the real party will be with the Tap Takeover podcast crew at Stein and Dine at the State Fair Expo Center in West Dallas, Wisconsin. Find us at the Physics booth. Try out physics, talk beer, and at 2.30, 3.15, and 4, we will be having special samplers for our listeners who stop by and let us know what their favorite interview was and why. One of the bombers we will be tapping is 19, this year's Central Waters Anniversary Stout. Tune in to upcoming episodes for the other two special beer tapping announcements. On April 23rd, the next day, Crafts and Drafts at Serb Hall in Milwaukee, the kickoff for Milwaukee Craft Beer Week that benefits ovarian cancer, the $80 teal ticket gets you a taste of Artius and Cygnus, the best stout of 2016 by Central Waters, along with entrance. These tickets are still available. Unfortunately, the $10 upgrade for a taste of Morning Delight by Toppling Goliath is sold out. Tickets have now gone on sale for this year's Firkenfest at Cathedral Square in downtown Milwaukee on Saturday, July 22nd. Get your VIP tickets now to get free reign over the crowds for the first hour of the festival. And this has been Beer News. That's right. So coming back from our refill break, we're back with the Kelsch and the Hefeweizen. So Scott and Nick, would you like to give us a little description of both of those for us? I'll start out with the Kelsch and then you can talk about the Hefeweizen. Just for all the listeners here, we've got a ton of beer on the table, so things are great right now. <laughs> Glad we took the break. Uh, so our Kilted Kelsch is it's a German style ale. It's going to be, uh, it's an ale, but it's fermented at a colder temperature. So what you get is a very crisp, light flavor. You get a lot of Pilsner that comes through. And I, I think I was talking about it earlier, just a little bit of a lemony twist to 
it that is very unique. Scott can talk a little bit more about the yeast we use, and that's where the name Kilted comes from. We actually use a, a little bit of a, an English yeast in there at the end to clean things off so it finishes very dry. But this is going to be one of the beers that's at Miller Park, so we'll be out there cheering the brewers on while we drink this beer. I'd have to say this would be very, very drinkable on a 90 degree day in Milwaukee at Miller it's, Park. It's probably, the, I mean, a Kelsch is a beer that equates as close to a Pilsner as you're going to get that's actually an ale. And the difference obviously being that lager yeast is a bottom fermenting yeast and ale yeast is a top fermenting yeast. It happens that this yeast ferments at 60 degrees. So you get some of the characteristics, the clean characteristics of, of lager yeast and some of the little bit of the sulfur overtones that you get with a, with a lager, you get in an ale which is, is one of the reasons why we chose to uh, brew this and when, when Kevin said, you know, what do you what do you do to the people that want a Miller Lite? <laughs> you know, in and, and, and your craft brewery. So that that was why I designed this beer the way it did. You know, the idea was to make something that is lighter, that drinks like a Pilsner, that doesn't require us to, to lager, doesn't require you require thirty days in the fermenter and some of the challenges that come to small breweries like this, but it's a very clean drinking beer, I think. It's got a little bit of sweetness to it, which is nice, I think. I actually think that's where it distinguishes itself from a Pilsner. Yeah. Uh, Pilsner, you get, sometimes it's overly, uh, like a cloying sweetness. Yeah. And with this one, it's there's a there's a really nice savory characteristic to it that underlies that sweetness. So yeah. the sweetness feels balanced in a yeah. certain way that I don't think a Pilsner could have. Right, yeah, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't have Chloe sweetness at all. So that was, that was the idea behind that. And, you know, so far it's been one of, <laughs> out of the tap room, one of our biggest sellers, interestingly enough. Yeah, well, yeah. It, I can see why. It's got a great multi backbone for as light of a beer it is. You're getting a ton of flavor of the grain coming through. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but there's also that really nice light effervescence. There's, uh, you know, it's a beautiful golden color. So you're getting, like, all the best aspects of a Pilsner and all the best aspects of a Kolsch. Uh, it's hats off again, guys. Yeah. Hats so off again. I'm going to correct you. It's Kelsch. There are umlauts Kelsch. over there. So uh, <laughs> when we opened up, we were just calling it Kolsch. And we had some uh, some old German dudes come in, and they, they scolded us. So the correct pronunciation is Kelsch. So next up, we have our, our Summer Weiss Hefeweizen, also a, a German-style beer. And we wanted to share these beers with you guys because they, they highlight some of our, our variety, where we've got very light, crisp beers, and we're going to get to the big, dark heavy beers next. I'll, I'll let Scott talk about the beer, but I want to talk a little bit about the name. When we first brewed it, we didn't have a name for it, and we just said the Germans don't give their beers name, they just call it Hefeweizen, and that's what it is. So we put it up on the board, but the four of us are sitting out on the patio in the front, it's the summer, and uh, we're it's beautiful, gorgeous day, 70 degrees out, and we're talking about, oh, maybe we should give it a name. And then conversation moved on, and we started talking about all the things you can do in summer that are great vices to have. One of the guys goes shooting, a couple of the guys have cigar every now and then and everybody's just got to have their great summer vice and I don't know who it was but they said hey that'd be a great name for a beer <laughs> and I shit you not just as that was said the storm clouds rolled in over the, the building and there was a thunder crack so it was like <laughs> it was it was like the gods have agreed that this is a great name for a beer let's do it so we heard that thunder crack and then we said all right there we go and then we moved inside because the rain came in and the way our patio is, you can't see the stuff rolling in from the west. So oh, it was like, just there. <laughs> yeah, it was just all of a sudden it got dark and there was a thunder crack, and then that's how that's how beer names are born. So and instead of it getting lost in further conversation, God Himself stepped in he and said, that. "Stop the conversation. <laughs> we have the name." That's right. That's he right. did. Yeah. 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 Amen to that. So awesome. I'll let Scott yeah. tell you more about the beer. Yeah, I mean, drinking. I think that the goal of this beer, from my mind's eye, was to create a beer with the clovey characteristics and not the banana characteristics that you so often get if you try to do a single infusion American style Hefeweizen you know and, and that comes comes you don't do the you don't do the rest at 112 113 degrees where you get the byproducts in the end that produce, the yeast end up producing I've had multiple people ask me what spice we put in this we don't put any spice in it it's doing that rest at the 112 113 degrees that allows the byproduct to be driven to the to the clove char clove characteristics that you get out of this beer. That's one of the things I like most about it. I'm always trying to continue to figure out how to accentuate that even more. That's kind of the uh, 
it's it's heavily wheat, sixty some odd percent wheat. But yeah, that's that's why it was designed the way it was. So for the edification of our listeners, why and what does resting the mash at different temperatures do to the work? In today's brewing industry, with the with the malts being as modified as they are, it's not as big a deal because the malts are very easily converted. But that rest at 112, 113 degrees produces a acid that the yeast then convert directly to the to the byproduct. So that rest is directly responsible for that. Then you can do protein rests in the in the low 200s that help break down the protein. So there there are things that were used and developed by the Germans long ago to deal with the fact that their their malts were not very modified. And what we mean by modified is are the sugars available? Because basically malt is is a process, right? Malt is not something. Malting is a process. It's about basically allowing the enzymes or building the enzymes that it takes to break down the starches into usable sugars. And that usable sugars might be for building block of the plant, but in this case, it allows our, our yeast to eat them and make it into uh, alcohol, ethanol. So magic. Magic, exactly. <laughs> Didn't know why it happened, but it happens. Wait, hey, cheers to magic. If it, yeah, tastes, if it tastes this you good. You know why. Yeah, it tastes this good. Cheers to magic. So I think that brings us right into number 100. And I mean, I was here for the release party, and I was really, really surprised. Me and my wife came got here about 10.30. We started selling it at 11, and we were parked over in Home Depot. What did you guys think of the response to that release? How, how epic was that for you guys to be able to have that line of people and just rip through all those bombers in an hour and a half at only two per person? Uh, surreal again for me. <laughs> like, wow. It's a little bit like our anniversary party. It was kind of an affirmation of some of the things that have happened and humbling that there's that many people that like your product and I didn't expect it. Yeah, it was, it was very humbling. We, we kind of had a gut feeling that it was going to be a big day, so we, we prepared for it. I just have to say we've got, we've got a lot of great people working here, and uh, they all jumped in, and they had a lot of really good suggestions. Got to give a shout-out to our apprentice brewer, Andy Hollander, because he just he stepped up that day and really he was just coaching everybody and just saying, I think you guys should do this. Let's do that. Everything that he suggested that we did, I think really made it a cool day. So, uh like I said, great people working here. Alex Stanton, our, our sales and distribution guy, full on helping out. Miles Patzer, just a bunch of guys that are fantastic people that we wouldn't be as successful as we are without them. Hats off to those guys. And uh, actually a guy who hadn't even started working for us, but we brought him on full time later that week. Justin Bushke as our, our assistant brewer was back here with his dad, Ron, helping sell bottles. Oh, and Andy's dad. I mean, yeah. we've just got everybody, <laughs> we've got everybody jumping in. Everybody was, everybody yeah, and it takes a village. It's a, it's a, it is a family, it's a family. And that's probably the single most touching thing to me moving into this business compared to what I do in the, the rest of the life tends not to be quite as joyous as this, um, and certainly not as familial oriented. I mean, it really feels like family when you're here, um, and everybody just pulls for everybody else. It's a, it's, a, it's a fun business. And certainly I didn't name everyone by name, but uh, you know, there are, we have 24 employees, and they're all doing a fantastic job. So even the, even the atmosphere was family, I mean, with the regulars that I saw. I mean, I've only been out here about a dozen times, but I mean, you had regulars giving you guys high fives in line as you were selling them beer. Yeah. It's just fantastic. So tell us a little bit about the beer, because I know you did something interested with the bourbon barrel aged coffee beans that not a lot of people have done. So why don't you give our listeners a little breakdown of number 100. This is, the base beer on this is our black walnut, our imperial stout. We imperialized it a little bit more, bumped it up a little bit to get the alcohol a little bit higher. Brewed it like we normally brew it. Um, then we went searching for the right uh, coffee combination, went to Hawthorne Coffee, and they actually have a bean there that they age, green bean that they put in with water with bourbon barrels. So they age it in bourbon barrels, and then they roasted it. And they roasted it day before they brought it to us. So they roasted it, you know, right, right as they, knowing they were going to bring it over. We had already been, the, the beer had fermented out. We had knocked it down to 50, about 55 degrees and with the goal of making a, if you will, a cold brew coffee. Uh, some places will take their coffee and actually make a cold brew and pour it in. Um, I'm just, I don't know, just stupid maybe, or I don't know any better. I just toss it right in, right? So what I did is... Wow, is that's living on the edge. You, yeah, could, you could infect the beer. Well, yeah. you, you could, you could, but coffee's a, the roasting process itself is a, is a, is a heating process where you don't, you don't run a lot of risk of that. But um, when, especially when it's a day did after. Did you run it past a doctor pathogens? 
I swabbed it. Okay. <laughs> I swabbed it. Yeah. No, I, no, I when plated they, it, swabbed it, you know, blood auger, <laughs> nothing grew. No colonies at all. So we were good to go. Okay. After we figured out we were good there, we tossed it in. And then I also went searching for Penzies and went looking for a, a cinnamon. I was looking for a cinnamon that had a, a bright, sweet... I mean, when you look, start tasting and smelling cinnamons, the tasting is not so yeah. good, smelling them. I wanted something that was bright and sweet, but obviously not cinnamon sugar. <laughs> So um, found the cinnamon that I thought was gonna work with it, and we pitched it right along with the coffee. Let it sit for 48 hours, and then dropped everything off to not get any sort of rancid flavors after that. And that's kind of the story of how we, how we built this beer. So which uh, cinnamon is it? Is it Madagascarian cinnamon, or is it a uh, it's, it, it's It's not a Mad Madagascarian, uh, and I, I don't, can't even tell you which <laughs> so reproducibility oh, is uh, it's I, low. I, I, I <laughs> nice try, it's not your journalism. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you do have a bottle, save it because or drink it because no. it's it's very the, unique. The cinnamon is I, I, what I detected immediately on the bouquet and the yeah. nose, and I was actually going to ask if it was an adjunct. Obviously, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just ground, no, it's it was great. ground cinnamon, and we just tossed it right in, and then crashed it off, because any of these things, that, just like what you do with, if you put vanilla in as well, yeah. um, you, you, you don't want to leave it sitting too long, and then the, the coffee sitting at 55 degrees, I think, really helped with not bringing out some of the bitterness that you can get from a dark roast coffee. So so the beer itself was not actually aged in bourbon barrels, it was just the coffee beans. Correct. That is right. a, that's Correct. a really fun... It's a twist. Yeah, really yeah. fun twist you on an old recipe. You get a little bit of the bourbon flavor through, yeah. you get a little bit of the coffee flavor coming through. None of it's overwhelming or overpowering. It is such a unique beer, and I mean, I drink it now. I, I didn't get to drink much of it. Drank a bunch of samples off the, the bright tank. And then uh, uh, I had one, I had one bottle that I got to enjoy, and then the rest we sold. So I mean, even we didn't get a lot of it. So is this coming back? I mean, are you guys going to do this every year? Well, this was our hundredth batch, and you can only have. Well, you can have the recipe. <laughs> you can have the recipe again. So a thousandth? What are I think, what are you looking at? I think you can see it coming back. I mean, if even the name if it comes back, back yeah. Thousand. Well, it can come yeah. back. It's just yeah. still called the hundred. And yeah, I know it's. There may or may not be a keg saved for our anniversary party. That cannot uh -oh. be confirmed uh -oh. or denied. Uh -oh. Yeah, we, we can have some breaking yeah. news. Yeah. That's your journalism. We can neither confirm nor disconfirm that to so, any... Uh, so for the listeners, when is your anniversary party? Uh, it'll, we don't have a date set, but it's going to be mid-September. Yeah. Okay. yeah, we've got to figure out when the weekends are. We don't even... We crash through everything because we're a small company and we don't have a, a huge marketing staff that can plan things out months in advance. So uh, we're going to figure that out, but it's going to be mid-September because that's when we opened our doors officially and we like to keep it around then. So one of the major focuses of our podcast is the beer collection. And we could definitely see this beer aging very nicely for a couple of years, taking on some different qualities. And we're, we're very interested in the cellaring process in general and how beers evolve. So tell us about your own cellars. Do you guys have any whales down there? Are you guys cellaring anything good? Space has is, is, is affected our ability to enter into the cellaring game and the barreling game. We, we, we have our, we have our uh, anniversary, this year's anniversary. We just actually last night put into some uh, barrels. So that's our first, well, we, we better, did a little barreling actually with the Saison of all things earlier, which was a pretty interesting beer. Um, it's something we plan on to get into a little bit more, but warehouse space and having sp space is a big part of being able to sell our beers like that and, and uh, age them appropriately. Personally, do you have something in your basement? Oh, like in our basement? Oh, yeah. 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 Your own yeah. personal cell. Yeah. yeah, sure. Andy's got a bunch probably. I do. Andy, not Andy has a bunch. My dad has a very impressive cellar inadvertently. He's got stuff from Central Waters 2012. Oh, oh really? You go down there and you're like, whoa, dad, let's drink these. Yeah. I usually drink them too fast. <laughs> I think I'm going to sit on them. Fair enough. Jimmy, though. I, I read I something about a beer Jimmy a day. Has right? some of, Jimmy has some of the stuff we brewed seven plus years ago. Wow. That oh, he wow. has not broke out. So, so some of the home there was beers. so yeah some wow. of the stuff we, we counter pressure filled at that time. You know sure. he's he uh, he has some stuff from that old. He broke one out on my birthday a year ago. Batch yeah. number one. It had batch number, number one, one written on the top. Oh, wow. all, all of our batches were labeled. They were labeled by numbers. We just put a one, two, three, four, five, you know, consecutively on up. So even as a remake, it still got the the new number. Um, so 
my guess is he's got some treats there. Very cool. And that kind of brings us to the, the next beer that we'll taste. Uh, we got to grab it out of the cooler, but Le Trois Docteur is, yeah. it was in the 60s. I don't, I can't recall what number we, we saw in the, the cap. I've got it written down somewhere, but these guys brought out a, a bottle and it had a, a number written on top of it and popped the top, poured it out, and we're like, whoa, what <laughs> is this beer? Just this fantastic nose to it where it smelled like wine, but it's not wine. It's got this deep caramely color to it, this great foam color to it. And it was just awesome. And we just stopped what we we're doing and we we're like, we got to figure out what this number 62 or 63 is. Those guys go back and it's it's a Belgian quad. We could taste that it was a some sort of Belgian beer quad, but it was brewed with Pinot Noir grapes from uh, from Christian out in the Willamette Valley that Scott and Jimmy yeah. have known for a long time. Once the harvest season came around, which is kind of like the second year evolution of of our, our opening that we uh, we were able to get those Pinot Noir grapes and then we brewed it, let it age for six months. Uh, that's what's coming up on Saturday. So crack right. that bottle. Yeah, that we should. Yeah, that's right. that's, that's, that's actually this is, aged uh, as well on some French oak. I think Spurs. this will be our breaking news for this podcast. <laughs> All right, I'm Alex, and I'm out at the Raised Grain La Trois Doctors special release event, and I'm here with... Dan and Dino. And where are you guys from? Milwaukee, Bayview, Whitefish Bay area. All right, and what brought you out to uh, Raised Grain today? Just uh, heard a lot of good things about the brewery. This is actually my first time here, and uh, found out they were going to have this release for the, their quad, and really excited about it. Here for delicious beer that's a little outside the standard. Awesome. What uh, what sort of beers do you guys typically get into? The the Belgian quads, or are you guys IPM in? Usually a quad is, I like to say that's kind of my second favorite style after the big barrel-aged imperial stouts, so um, I usually like to try to get quads when I can get a hold of them, but they're usually a little rarer to find, especially at big release events like this. I have a fondness for Belgian beers. Uh, I do not really like much for IPAs or pale ales. Not really my thing. There's there's some that are still good, but I tend to like the bigger, heavier, maltier beers these days. So. And what's the last best beer that you guys have had recently? Oh man, trying to think. Oh, well, I'll just uh, go to last night. It was a very sad time. This is the last bottle that I had of this that I drank, but uh, I had been aging some My Turn Josh from Lakefront. That uh, it was probably about nine months old, something like that. Ages very well. If anybody has any out there, I recommend sitting on it for a little bit. Tastes great, mellows a little bit, and still got a nice bite from the hops. Uh, just the other night, just for the hell of it, I cracked open my only bottle of barrel-aged 12 Dog from Black Husky for the from the first run, actually. So it was 18 months in the cask, and it's three years old. So... <laughs> It was delicious. Yeah, it was really good. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming out. All right, Alex Kuhn here with the Tap Takeover Podcast, and I'm here at the front of the line with the uh, the guys who have been out here the longest. What, what's your name and where are you from? Um, Tim. I'm from Sheboygan. All right, and what brings you out so early to uh, to get this beer, Tim? We've always liked Raised Grain. We've been here since the early months. Not, we don't come here regularly, but, like, I don't know. We're coming from Sheboygan, you know. So what's your favorite beer uh, that they have on tap typically? Honestly, it's mostly the seasonal one. Uh, Hop Doctor is my brother's favorite. I actually really like the uh, Bird's Eye Triple. Nice. Yeah, they do some really good ones. We were here actually for the 100th release of the uh, Imperial Stout. Batch 100. Yeah, the Batch 100. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. Um, we're there for the 100th. Again, we were actually not the first ones in line, but we were right about here for the last time. Um, that time we were actually here at 5 in the morning. Oh, man. So what time did you guys come out this morning? We got here about like 6.30ish. Yeah, it was kind of awkward. We were the only ones in the parking lot. We stayed in the car and then we are like, yeah, screw this. We're going to get some breakfast. So we went up, went, went, got some breakfast, came back, saw like five cars back in right now and uh, decided, to, yeah, why not just pick our uh, chairs and sat down and drink beer. Nice, nice. So you guys had a little taste in this morning? Awesome. Any uh, any whales? What'd you guys crack? Nothing special. Uh, mostly just grow that we got filled last night at Three Sheeps. Especially since we're from Sheboygan, Three Sheeps is kind of our only brewery in Sheboygan. About an hour and a half away. So yeah, it's a, it's quite a ways to travel for this Belgian quad. After this, we're going to go to Fermentorium. Another release at Fermentorium, a divine sanctuary. Awesome. And what, what kind of beer is that one? That's uh, actually aged in bourbon and Chardonnay. Okay. There's actually two versions. So yeah, we're looking forward to that one actually as well oh, sounds like you guys have a clock so yeah sounds like you guys have a really fun day planned uh, yeah kind of and then uh, head back home and relax and everything awesome well thanks so much for talking with us 
And we're back with Le Trois Data, amazing Belgian quad here, guys. It's something I've never had before. So again, tell us about what this is. This is a base of, of a, I would say, you know, just a very golden Belgian style ale fermented with the classic Belgian yeast. Let, let it run, produce some estuary banana profiles at first. But I think the key to this whole beer is, is the Pinot Noir grapes. My buddy that I, I went to medical school with, he's a surgeon and lives in uh, Willamette Valley and you know, they're one of the king places in the United States for Pinot Noir grapes. And he sent us 100 pounds of late pick Pinot Noir grapes that we pressed off, added in the last two minutes of the spin, and then we actually took bags and put the, put the pressed off skins and, and stems actually into the mash tun as we were doing it. And it's created a beer that I don't even quite know how to explain. I, I didn't know exactly how it was going to turn out, but it's, it's delicate. It's nearly a wine. And then we aged it for four months on French oak on top of it. I think it was six looking back six? at the, yeah, the production schedules and all that so stuff. So six, yeah. six months. But it, it, Time flies. It's interesting because it, <laughs> it's been through iterations as it's... So we, we, we drink all of our beers all the time. I mean, you see what happens as they age. We, we age this in one of our big uh, fermenters. It's gone through a period of being very banana dominant to a point now where the, the bananas have very much stepped in the background. And it begins, in my, in my mind, it begins with the nose. And the nose is great, great, great. You drink it, you get some of the banana, but it also finishes with the grape on the backside. And for a quad, I mean, you have a lot of quads out there that are kind of cidery and, and real strong. This is a really delicate big beer, which is an odd combination to have, I think, anyway. It's, 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 it's wine-esque, is what I would say. It's, yeah, for two, it's 10.2%, but you don't know that when you taste it. The, it's not oh, like, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think there's a there's not a boozy, you're not overpowered by the alcohol flavor. And I think that's something that not only this beer, but our Black Walnut, our Bird's Eye Belgian, that uh, Scott and Jimmy have done a great job of balancing all the flavors. You need to have a little bit of an alcoholic flavor. You need the carbonic light from the CO2. You need the malt. You need the hops. But they've done a fantastic job of building these flavors all together so that you have a really, really robust, amazing experience when you drink all your beer. You know, I want to go back to actually a previous podcast with Dave Olson. He recommended like chewing a beer. And if you do that with this, you really taste the grapes. So if you kind of like put it between your, you know. Basically, you're, you're taking your tongue and pushing it up towards the roof of your mouth and getting it into flavor receptors that it wouldn't normally get into. That's a, a chewing kind of thing yeah, that, that they've turned us on to. Yeah, so I've been That's trying nice. that since then. And you can really pick up that different, more grapes in that aspect. I have to say, guys, this stuff is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, my favorite beer from you is actually Jimmy's Trip Home that you do once a year. I have to give a shout out to it. It's been replaced. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, it's, wow. It's, it's delicious. When you guys first described this with the Pinot grapes, I was a little worried. Uh, my mind immediately went to like a Berliner Weiss, that kind of like a sour flavor. I'm, I think I'm on record as, as not being a huge fan of the sours. So I was a little bit worried, but this is, I think delicate is the perfect word to use. There's a delicate flavor here. It's a delicate balance between just just some very powerful flavors between the banana and the and the clove and the little bit of grape and, and just everything going on here is a, is a very delicate balance it could have gone sideways very easily and the fact that you guys were able to pull this out when you did and it's just fantastic cheers gentlemen cheers to another another yeah, success yeah, yeah, yeah. good job so we've said that a couple times Sante Belgian for to your health. It's a kind of a traditional, uh, whether you say prost or salute, it's all to your health. We've got a Belgian background. Jimmy brings that to us. Sante. Sante. Yeah. So getting back to the beer, it's pouring a dark copper. So a little lighter than a dark Belgian strong. Yep. That might be because of the uh, Pinot. The nose is definitely bigger than the finish. The finish, it, it's very dry, but the nose is spectacular. You're getting the esters that are coming from the beer on the nose, but on the palate, it's a lot of delicate flavors. I mean, it's wave after wave. You have to almost think about the flavors that are coming across. The French oak is in there too, some spot. You know, it's that's tougher to pick on, but midway through, I think you get a little bit of the French oak. Oh, so and is that new French oak then? Yeah, so it's actually Frank, French oak spirals. So we okay. we uh, took full thing spirals French oak and, and dropped it in. And it sat with it the entire time it was, it was aging. Oh, great. So there's no massive barrel warehouse 
that no. uh, you store the no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we didn't we didn't micro oxygenate it, but it, it's it, the stainless steel version of oak aging. No, it well, definitely picks excellent. up that yeah. character. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I don't think you can talk about this beer without the name of it. This is because of yeah. I, I want to know more. Clock. Yeah, I want to know more about you just being a doctor and making this whole thing work. You know, well, and not just one doctor. Not yeah, yeah. Well, we got two doctors. Doctor. I mean, this is this this is three, but the third is 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 owns his own vineyard out. And does he have a label that we should pin? Yes, he does. It's uh, <laughs> Abalone, Abalone, which is named after his mother. Nice. And so, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I've known Christian for a long time before I knew Jimmy actually. So he was a medical student, a fellow medical student with me. Like I said before, Jimmy, Jimmy, I met as a chief resident. So how it works as a, as a, as a doc and doing all this is is I'm lucky. I'm an empty nester at this point. I wouldn't have probably been able to or wanted to do this while my girls were still around. But you know, they left the same year this idea hatched itself. Mm-hmm. And I have a supportive wife who realized that you know I have a lot of interest in probably to keep me doctor and I need to do something else as well. And it's a great, <laughs> way, to, it's a great way to get you out of the house. It does get me out. Of <laughs> that was her goal. She she definitely succeeded in that. No, um, the- it's it's been an all encompassing sort of thing for me. You know, and, and from designing this brewery to running everything. You know, now I finally have two two assistants as well that you know really have helped take the little bit of load off of me. Early on, it was 100 hours a week easy between the two. But it's a it's a it's a passion. I I got to tell the story. It, it, Do it because it's it's not <laughs> it's 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 almost crazy that how it happened. But three months prior to everything happening that Nick talked about before, where where Kevin came to me and Nick came to me and said, "Do you want to be you know the brewer you know and bring your recipes to a professional brewery?" I was at a uh, party with just three other couples. We did a game where you had to toss in your uh, your bucket list items, right? And everybody has to reveal their bucket list items. I had two bucket list items, only two. The first was I wanted my wife to pay 18 holes of golf with me because she wanted to. <laughs> and enjoyed it. And the second was I wanted to serve my beers and our beers, Jimmy, my beers, to people other than friends. So you achieved one, right? Later that summer, <laughs> uh, oddly enough, my wife is now into golf and actually has played 18 holes up. So I'm ready to die. Oh, what? <laughs> well, don't. don't. Which, which we need we're to not make ready for. Yeah. All my girls are out. Two, two weddings paid for. Two more paid for, and that's four weddings and a funeral. I'm good. Uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're we're going to need joking. we're going to need a few more batches of La Trois Docteur before you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very so, yeah, cool story. So, yeah. yeah. So I mean, you know, I, I think we both we, we weave it in. Jimmy has a different sort of profession than I have. I'm a pathologist. I read slides, make diagnoses. Okay, so I don't have my my clients, if you will, are physicians, and I'm reading pieces of tissue that come from patients which allows me a lot more flexibility than if I had a patients coming to see me where I had an office full of patients all day long and I can I start very early I start reading before 6 a.m. and it allows me to answer phone calls as I, I need to stand up and leave if I have to get out early if I have to that's been the key for my profession allowing me to do it largely based on, on what I feel the medicine I'm in. Any, any plans to transition into brewing full-time? I get that question all the time. <laughs> I bet you do. I bet you do. All the time. You should. With <laughs> beers this successful, I well, bet you do. You know what? My, my, my answer has become that as the as one of the owners of the business, I would be an irresponsible business owner to pay myself as brewmaster what I can make as a doctor. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what that is, but we well, have to grow significantly. Yeah. No, no. It, um, <laughs> So you'll I be would fine. say my passion. I have a lot of passion for this. I, I, I really love this, and it's it's been a it's been a skip in my step. Um, Seventeen years of doctoring is. I, I like what I do as a, as a physician. It's a, it's a, it's been a tough time in medicine, as you can imagine, and this is really a breath of fresh air. So that's the best thing I can say about it. It's been great. So we've talked about uh, long-term expansion and that sort of idea. We've talked about the uh, the brewers' agreement that you guys have struck. What what do you guys see as your challenges specifically for 2017? Where do you guys envision yourselves going by the end of the year? I think short term is is going to be what we can do production here and how we can manage that, how we can manage growth. The tap room, you can probably hear some of the hum picking up over the course of the podcast in the background. We started when the tap room opened and now it's booming out there. Oh, it's getting busy. On a Wednesday. On a Wednesday. You guys are cranking out there on a Wednesday. So, um, we've got a lot of beer that we have to produce for the tap room. We're in only about 50 accounts right now draft and then we've got about 10 accounts for bottles right now. 
but how we're gonna even keep up with those accounts as we continue to get busier with Miller Park, with our tap room, with those accounts and our, our outside beer sales. It's gonna be our, our short-term challenge. We're, we're actively working on stuff right now to figure out how we're gonna solve those problems. Nothing, no gotcha journalism here. We don't have anything that we can. Darn. Yeah, I wish I could give you, I, I wish I could <laughs> yeah. say what we're doing. We don't know yet. We can make it up later. I, thought, well, I, also, I would like to add that I, I think our challenge, one of the things that we're most challenged by, um, in the fact that, not that Nick's not in it for the fun, uh, but I'm in it to a large degree for, for, the, for the fun, is maintaining that sort of connectivity that we have with our patrons right now and the supporters of our product and, and the loyal customers that we have is, how do you st- how do you grow and stay small at the same time? That's the single yeah. business. That's, biggest we all, challenge we all, that we, we, all we, yeah. we all talk about this as as owners all the time because it is it is one of the big challenges. It's one thing to you know set up a huge production facility, start running people shift after shift. Your employees start to be shift workers and, and not necessarily connected to what you're doing. And not to mention that, but all your customers are not necessarily as heavily connected as you'd like them to be. So that is something we're acutely aware of is staying that staying connected. So let's get into a little bit of the business side because I, I, I love the financial. Are you guys still self-financed? Or, yep. 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 100%. So you're, you don't have any outside investors? Nope. You don't have anyone pulling the strings telling you what to do, how to grow? Nope. No no, no plans to go on Shark Tank anytime soon? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there, there are opportunities out there for, for, I mean, there's plenty of opportunities with the success we had so far to find investors in, but all Oh, yeah, we could walk up. out there right now and find 30 people that oh, are yeah. interested in, yeah. in investing. Most of them joking, but... Um, <laughs> uh, but if they had the money, they do it, right? Well, yeah, it's a fun business to be in. No, I think it's it's neat to see all the different ways that breweries are starting up. Some are starting up much smaller than us. Some are starting up significantly larger than us. It's fun to see all the different business models and how they're gonna they're gonna net out. Yeah, nobody knows. Nobody knows if we're gonna be successful. Nobody knows if the small ones or the big ones are gonna be successful. It's gonna be neat. It's it's a fun ride over the next five years because there are some really really big changes that are gonna happen, and we're gonna hopefully ride that wave successfully. Awesome. So. Before- before Alex wraps it up for us here, I got one more question for you. You guys have been quoted as saying you want to elevate Wisconsin to the level for beer that California is for wine. Is your work with the Craft Brewery League one of the things you're doing to help achieve this goal? Absolutely. I mean, the Milwaukee Craft Brewery League and the uh, Wisconsin Brewers Guild are, are working on some very big things. Just to focus on what the Milwaukee Craft Brewery League is doing, we're, uh, we're really focusing hard on elevating Milwaukee. We've got a really cool story to tell. I mean, Miller, Caps, Schlitz, Blatt, all of those, Leinen Kugels, all of those, they have a place in Wisconsin's beer history. It gives us a story that nobody else can tell. Then we have craft pioneers. We have Lakefront, Sprecher, Milwaukee. They're making some really great beer and they've been doing it for a long time. And then you've got us, you have Good City, you have Third Space, you've got the plethora of new breweries that are popping up and, and we've got that three-legged stool. We've got the beer bloggers coming in in August of next year. So we've got some really cool stories to tell. Craft beer is as much about the story as it is about the beer. We've got great beer. We hope to continue to tell great stories to go along with that great beer. Yeah, we want to see ourselves 10, 15 years where California is now in terms of wine and beer because they've been doing a great job at that. Wisconsin has been underrepresented in the, the craft market for a while, but that boom is here. We're part of it and it's a very exciting time. I don't know how we're going to get there. We're, we're all just nose to the grindstone and every now and then we can step back to look at what we're doing and I think we're going in the right direction. It starts with the beer that Scott and Jimmy are making. And I think a, a gold medal at the Great American Beer Fest is a great start. It's an amazing <laughs> start. we just like to thank you guys for coming out. That's well, it. Thank you, guys. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you for the opportunity to tell our story. I mean, it's, it's great what you're doing right now is, is getting this, these stories out because I think that's an integral part of the whole thing. And thank you to everyone that's listening because uh, you're, you're excited about the beer. We encourage you to come out and try our beer, try the other breweries in Milwaukee because that's what's going to make us successful. If, if you go out and uh, you see a Milwaukee brewery or some other brewery from you know West Coast, East Coast or whatever, get what's local because that's what's going to help accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. Buy local beer, get to know who's brewing your beer, 
find what you like. So before Alex tells us there's no more beer, everybody, Google Raise Grain, hit the directions, and come on out here and try some. It's fantastic. I'll make it even easier. RGBrewing.com. Check us out. And check us out on our Facebook page at the Tap Takeover Podcast and TapTakeoverPodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what you guys thought about Raise Grain. So thank you guys so much for sitting down with us. It's been a, a real honor. A real Sante. honor. Sante. 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 Sante.